Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome back Andy Constant of Damp Spring. Andy, congrats on five years. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. I appreciate it, Nick. Good to be back. Okay, Andy, let's start with the stock market. Down about 4% from the all-time highs is the top in for the year for the S&P 500. Well, I think so, but it also depends a lot on how policymakers react and uh, they have levers that can uh, cause uh, the um, the markets to move. So, you know, I'm looking at future levers, but um, based on what I think is going on in the markets, uh, yeah, we probably have reached our top. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by River. Make sure to check out river.com today or the link below in the description. River is our preferred place to purchase Bitcoin. Now, when you're buying Bitcoin, guys, there are several considerations. Number one, should I be using an exchange? Is the exchange custodying their own Bitcoin? Is the exchange using platforms to custody that we don't know? Is the exchange leveraging its Bitcoin for other purposes? Well, with River, we know that River does not use leverage of any kind. River also uses its own multi-sig solution so that your Bitcoin are not held by anybody else. So it's a very important thing to understand about what River offers. Now, River also has Lightning Network integration and a lot of other really exciting features. Go check out river.com today. Okay, so let's talk about then treasury yields. One of your main points of analysis over the past several months has been the quarterly refunding announcements from the Treasury Department. How much size is coming to the market? So explain to us the concept of term premium, if you will, and why more Treasury supply out the curve should steepen the curve, increase term premium, and what that does to the risk asset class? Sure. So uh, the basic idea is that every single asset, stocks, any long-term asset, are a gamble at some basic level that an investor needs to be compensated for taking. You know, if you and I met on the street and you said, hey, I'm really interested in gambling. Can you, would you flip a coin with me and, you know, I'll pay you a dollar if it comes up heads and you pay me a dollar if it comes up tails. You know, I'd probably keep walking because I'm not looking to gamble. I'm looking to invest and I would like a return on my money. So it doesn't make sense for me. But for you, you may have a need to gamble or more relevantly, if you're a corporation, a mortgagee or the U.S. government or a municipality or anyone who issues equity and bonds, you have places for that money that I would pay you to buy. And so as an investor, what you need is some incentive to gamble. And so in the street example, you know, you'd have to say, well, I'll pay you $1.05 five if, you, if, you, if it comes up heads, and you only have to pay me 95 cents. And in that way, I have a expected value that exceeds zero. And that's risk premium. Cash really doesn't carry risk premium because we all can, you know, that exchanges fairly at the spot price of cash. We can buy stuff with it. We can invest it. We can do all the things we want with cash. And short-term assets like T-bills and two-year notes really don't have any volatility, much volatility. So we pretty much know what we're going to earn um, with very, very low risk. And for that reason, those things tend not to have any uh, risk premium to them. You don't get any more than you would if you just held your cash. And so a basic principle in investing is that because corporations, mortgages, governments, etc., want to borrow and have uses in the real economy for that money that they borrow from you, an investor gets a term premium, gets a risk premium. And that's why owning any type of portfolio that's fairly diversified and you can get into the weeds about what that means. But any portfolio held for 20, 30, 40 years 
is going to exper experience better returns than if you just held that money in T-bills throughout that period of time. And that's shown through history. Now, there are bad times to buy assets and good times to buy assets. The times when you want to buy assets are when there's a ton of savers and very few assets. And the economic conditions look like they're going to not be very volatile. So you really aren't going to experience any significant risk in holding assets. So those are the two levers. Your future expected risk of owning assets is low or lower than people expect is the most important part. And there are lots of savers and not a lot of assets. And so that's when, that's when investing is, um, you know, really attractive. But even when it's not attractive, if you hold it long enough, you're going to get an excess return over that cash. Now, I want to ask you about the real yield on treasuries versus the term premium on treasuries. So we're thinking about the 10-year part of the curve. We see real yields increasing as yields are increasing. So meaning the nominal yield increase is due to an increase in real yield. At the same time, we see term premium increasing as the curve steepens out a little bit. Now, I know the two are different constructs, but how do we think about these two things happening at the same time for the asset class? And as you mentioned, going out the curve is, is the gamble in treasuries because being in the front end of the curve, there is no risk volatility associated with that. Right. So I guess the way I would think about it is I would, instead of focusing on real yields, nominal yields, and inflation expectations, I would step back and say that I would construct it slightly differently. And what I would do is I'd say one way of constructing a bond, a long-term bond yield is that it is the expected path of cash which has all those growth and inflation things built into it. So you can extract all the idea of growth and inflation. You just say the expected path of what cash will earn plus this risk premium. Okay, so that's another way of thinking about how bond yields work. The one that you started on was, well, real yields tend to uh, be, well, they're, they have no inflation component to them. So what they are, are the sort of expectations of future real growth. And to the extent that real growth is higher, you want to be compensated in owning a, a real asset by its yield. And so when growth expectations rise, real yields, real yield, real yielding assets fall. And then there's inflation expectations to get the difference between real yields and nominal bonds. And so as those move, there's, um, you know, the implication is that as inflation expectations rise, real yields may stay the same, but nominal yields will rise. Um, so when you take those things together, and I think you have to take those things together and notice that when I decomposed nominal yields by real yields plus inflation expectations, um, I didn't include anything about term premium or, or risk premium. But, you know, that's, what, that's when you look at the prices of tips and you look at the prices of nominal bonds, that's all you get. So what I'm then saying is that real yields and inflation expectations both have a portion of the term premium built into them. So to answer your question, real yields have risen. Part of that is rising growth expectations. The rest of that is rising term premiums. Understood. So, so then focusing on the term premium component itself is the important part of it which brings me back to the quarterly refunding. Where are we in the path now going forward? We, we have a May 1st refunding announcement. We're going to get updated numbers. We know the Treasury has a lot of money it needs to raise. We know that bills have been outsized in the portion of the issuance. So 
what is your expectation and what is your expectation for how that will impact term premium? And then please tell us, Andy, how is Yellen approaching this? What is she thinking about? What is she worried about? Is she worried about the curve steepening out? Is she worried about treasury yields rising? Yeah, so I haven't written down um, that information yet in terms of projections for what is going to happen on the QRA and what to look f- and what my precise levels are and how that's all going to play out. And I'm going to deliver that to clients on the 28th of, uh, of, of April ahead of the two day, three day refunding. Um, but I will give you some um, some things about what happened last time and some things to at least pay attention to instead of getting into the specific predictions. Um, so the first thing is that uh, on 429, Monday, uh, April 29th at 3 p.m., the Treasury will tell will announce and tell the TBAC two things. One is how much funding they need to plan for. Uh, how much they have to schedule, uh, which is really the needs of the government to raise money, the net needs of the government to raise money. And then what they plan to hold in their checking account, the Treasury General account. Currently, they plan to end um, June with $750 billion. And you have to look to whether they will, where they will project to end September. And the combination of those two, of where they start and where they end, which to the extent that it's the same is helpful in terms of the simple math. If it's the same, any new money that they raise will be to pay off uh, expenditures in excess of, of, um, of uh, revenue, which is the, def- the primary deficit, and also any bonds that mature including the Treasury um, maturities, uh, sorry, the Fed maturities that uh, the Fed owns, um, less what they expect the Fed to buy, because the Fed is continuing to reinvest um, during QT, um, but the less will depend on whether the Fed tapers or not. And then that gives you uh, the... um, net funding needs. And so that'll be an important thing on 429. You know, I expect, I think tax receipts are going in pretty well. They're not 2022 sort of levels, but they are quite large. And so it's possible they have less issuance to do. Um, And so that's something to pay attention to. What's the total net issuance they're going to do? And it's possible they change the TGA for whatever reason. Um, and then on 5-1 at 8.30 in the morning, which is the same day as the FOMC um, announcement and press conference, they'll just tell us the composition. And the composition is important. They've made it harder to understand, and it's going to get even more difficult to understand um, when they release it uh, this time, um, in that they've changed their format, and all they'll give you is the gross issuance of treasuries that they plan on making. Um, and so the question is, will that grow? Will that shrink? How will it compare to last quarter? I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but there's another thing to look for um, that is important in um, on the 5-1 announcement, which is they're almost certain to announce the Treasury Buyback Program, which is a duration neutral program to buy roughly 10 billion of coupon bonds a month that are off the run and illiquid and fund them with similar maturity, similar duration, um, new issuance. And so the way that's communicated will make the, the read through of the news a little complicated. So that's something I'm paying attention to. How's that displayed and what does it all mean? Um, so, that's what we're going to get. And so I'll set you up with how it's gone. Um, in Q3, uh, the Treasury uh, issued $180 billion roughly of coupon bonds. And then on July 31st, while they were issuing that relatively small amount of coupon bonds, they announced that they were going to 
it increased the amount of coupon bonds to about 338 billion net. And that caused a big reaction in term premium and bond yields, which got reversed on Halloween when they announced that they were not going to continue to increase coupon net issuance, um, keeping it at around 348 billion. On 2-1, they announced they were going to substantially increase coupon issuance up to where it, it, it is, which is now ongoing, at uh, $538 billion of net issuance for uh, Q2. And so we're in the process of that distribution. And you notice that's about $190 billion more coupons per quarter than they had planned on, uh, than they had been issuing and you know 400 billion more than they issued in Q in Q3. So there's quite a bit of coupon bonds for sale and I think that is the one of the reasons as I said when do you want to buy assets when there when there's lots of savings and not and not many assets. This is a circumstance where the amount of assets has gone up a lot. And in particular a lot of that those assets are being funded by um, those who had been owning bills and now are being asked to own longer duration coupons. And so those are more risky. And so there's a concession that happens. And I think that's what's been happening to the bond market um, since February 1st. Um, how Now let's talk about the levers. Um, it, to the extent that, um, so let's talk about the Treasury's objectives. Currently, I, I think I looked in end of March, uh, there's about 22.7% of the federal um, public debt that is um, bills. And that's at a very, very high level. Um, typically, it's only at that level during um, recessions when the government needs money really quickly to offset the impact of recessions. Uh, and yet it's still at a very high level and we've seen robust economic growth. So it's been their objective to uh, have that roll over and get back into the target range of between 15 and 20 percent. But they're in, they have shown that they're in no hurry to do that. But that is their direction. And they made a fairly meaningful step in Q uh, with the Q2 issuance because they're actually reducing bills by 300 billion and increasing coupons by roughly 500 billion. So um, they are making a step to it, but it's a long process. And I expect for years, the fraction of issuance to be largely coupons um, for, for the, you know, the foreseeable future. The size and who gets the money? Is it the Fed? Do they still... Are they still in QT? When will that taper? When will that? When will the program end completely? I think we're a trillion dollars away from it ending completely, but and I think the Fed thinks that, but they are thinking about slowing down, and that'll have an impact. Uh, but the Treasury extending its um, uh, issuance to coupons makes good sense because coupon bonds do not offer much of a term premium. And remember, an investor wants a term premium, so they want that term premium to be as high as possible. So that means the investor today is getting a lousy deal. Well, that means the government is getting a great deal. So I think they're going to you know, maintain their issuance. Um, now, as I said, that's caused bond yields to rise, and that puts an anchor on stocks and is part of the reason why I'm not I uh, you know called a top in stocks. Um, even though the economy is very strong, that higher yield is putting an anchor on stocks, which could drag it under, and the economy with it. And so now you get into politics, and I don't know. Um, these levers are very, you know, I think they're very impactful for markets, but I think they're pretty dull for the economy. And you have to ask yourself, what is the optimal thing for um, Biden to get elected, which presumably would influence Treasury and their actions? And I can't tell. Honestly, I, I, I don't know. Um, is it, you know, if we had the choice between a 5,500 5, S&P and, you, you know, gas prices 30 percent higher than they are today, and those are your two choices. And if you pull one lever, you get the first choice. 
And if you pull the other lever, you get the second choice. The same lever, you move it in different directions, you get the second choice. And those are your only outcomes. I don't know which one she'd pick. But I do know that she doesn't want jobs. Jobs are a pretty clear thing. So to the extent that she could avoid uh, you know, negative NFP prints, she may choose to pull a lever. And that lever would be one of two things she could, out, could announce on 5.1. One. one is a significant reduction in the amount of coupon bonds that are being issued, which would cause asset prices to rally and protect companies um, keep financing costs for companies low, which would allow them to retain workers. Um, and then the other thing she could do is um, she could tweak the Treasury General account, meaning how much money she plan, uh, plans on having aside for a rainy day. Now, that's a very popular thing that many uh, participants out there, including very well-known people like Michael, Michael Howe um, and others, suggests that the the Yellen administration the Yellen treasury could spend down the TGA which would result in a big flush of uh, instead of instead of the spending for regular government activities being financed by issuance it would be financed by prior issuance and that would cause assets to rally as it has repeatedly so those are the two levers, and so we'll see what they actually, what she actually pulls, and whether, and you know, I can't figure myself. I can't figure out her reaction function. Like, what what would she choose? And so we will look for the quarterly refunding announcement to tell us how much coupon issuance is going to come. The more coupon issuance that comes relative to market expectations, we can expect risk markets to react negatively to that type of dynamic. And so, Andy, I want to ask you, I have so many questions, but let's then talk about the downside risk of stocks. Let's assume that for a second that the quarterly uh, refunding announcement comes back with healthy supply of coupons, which will increase term premium, which will affect asset prices. You mentioned that the government and the central bank has levers in which it could help bounce stocks, but absent a policy response, you have talked about leaving higher for longer island, heading toward recession island. What are your thoughts as we think about stocks having, let's assume that stocks have their top in for the year in your, in your base case expectations. What is the path then for the economy? Does a recession happen as a result? It does it happen concurrently as rates stay high. How do you see that playing out? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not a particular, I'm a very optimistic person and do not think of um, calling for a stock market top to be a, you know, a pessimistic thing. It's just, you know, it's just, we're trading markets. Um, and I would think it would be awful if we have a meaningful uh, recession. Um, and, I don't think we're going to have either of the, uh, we're going to have that sort of thing. Um, but I do think it's very important that inflation is brought back to target. Um, and so, and the reason I think that is because when it stays above target for an extended period of time, it stand, tends to then go higher. And I think inflation is a terrible tax on all of us. Um, and as much as I hate the idea that job losses are the solution to inflation, and that means some pain for the people that lose their jobs. I think it's more important that the Fed achieves its, man its inflation mandate. And so I believe that over the last 40 years, the way that inflation has occurred is by a sharp, something breaks, rapid recession that then the Fed can uh, and policy and fiscal policymakers can step in and offset and cause a V bottom. Um, and when I look at the financial system today, we don't have that circumstance. Private credit, private leverage is lower than it has been in many other periods of this nature. And while um, for the past 40 years, when something broke, Aggressive action could be done by the Fed because we were in a globalization, disinflationary um, 
era of 40 years. Um, that's not in place anymore. So we have private sector health, banks in particular, very healthy, the big banks, very, very healthy. Um, um, corporations, very healthy. Mortgage holders, those who own homes, very healthy. Uh, because they financed at very low rates for a very long time. Um, and so nothing's going to break. Now, there'll be individual breaks, of course. That always happens. But nothing systemic is going to break. And so to kill inflation, you really have to kill demand. And in this cycle, demand is coming from wage growth. And if wage growth is what is creating this new demand, um, you have to slow wage growth. How do you slow wage growth? You make it harder for a person to find a job, to hold a job, and to negotiate for higher salaries. How do you do that? Unfortunately, you fire the guy sitting next to him. Um, and then the question is, how will that play out? So my script, which I wrote about in July of last year, suggests that in this type of cycle, what has to happen is equity prices and bond prices have to fall so that the cost of financing, there's a wealth effect, which is what it is, um, but the cost of financing new projects um, because of higher credit spreads, higher um, long-term bond yields, higher cost of equity because the price of the equity is lower, projects become more expensive to start and that slows the economy and slows demand because there are no workers that would have been um, hired to make that project and that project and then there's no income and so that income is somebody else that spending that people get from their income is somebody else's income and you start slowing the economy and that's i think playing out as bonds and stocks start have been falling since the QRA in February. Um, stocks not yet, but now they're catching down. Um, and I don't know whether we end up with the proverbial soft landing where we get inflation under control without so much demand destruction that you see a, in, a rapid increase in unemployment. My guess is we're going to have to have some form of recession to get inflation under control, but you know it's still possible. And then the central bank, the, the policymakers may um, attempt to offset or, it's, or not offset these pressures. And depending on what they do, you could have very different outcomes. But in the end, you know, what I'm thinking of for the near term is there's, um, you know, I think there's about 25 basis points of yield increase in term premiums that has to flow through the market over the, assuming Janet doesn't change QRA in a meaningful way, um, that has to flow through the market to absorb this supply. And that has an impact of about four to five percent on equity prices. So if things play out well, the economy stays strong, inflation does come in, in, into, into balance, you know, I think a 5% correction from here, which would be about a, you know, a little less than 10% from the peak, is perfectly fine. Now, will it be acceptable politically? I think so. It will we'll still be up quite a bit for um, the 12-month period prior and even, uh, even for the year. Um, so it's not a super bearish scenario. The question is, will it gain momentum? We've been in a very momentum-driven market. And more so than any time in my career, uh, momentum has been um, very strong upside in, in equities. It now was taken over by gold, very strong negative momentum in bonds. And so could we overshoot those things? Yes, those targets, if you want to call them that. But will they then cause real economy weakness so that we then have a, a, a bigger recession? Maybe. And if that happens, will the central bank and policymakers be able or willing to ease? And inflation still lingers. So I don't think the Fed is going to be comfortable easing in as much as they have in the past, given that inflation pressure still lingers. 
And the, the policymakers are in gridlock through the election and maybe in gridlock after, or maybe one party or the other has, a, has a, all um, branches of the government. Um, and the outcomes will be different depending on how those policymakers act. So it's interesting to hear how Andy definitely has um, at least one eye on the political situation, um, not only the Treasury's influence on the November election, but how the Fed politically has to react to a slowdown in the economy or stock prices given the sticky inflation that's hanging around. So Andy, I want to ask you next about um, the global disinflation trend that you mentioned. Is this something that, or just explain to us why you believe we are in the end or that period has ended and we're transitioning to a period of sustained inflation. Does that have something to do with China or or globalization in general, or is it something else? It's all those things. Um, I think the first thing that you have to look at um, is the marginal productivity that got, got, that got created over the last few decades. When you took a dirt farmer in China and brought them to the city to a factory, you got massive productivity. And that created real growth in, in China and cheap goods for the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, the U.S. doesn't like the fact that China has our manufacturing capabilities, but we didn't have that ability to produce more goods at low cost. And so that productivity rush um, has played out in China. And now demogra demographics, there's less dirt farmers to bring to the cities, and thus there's less um you know, productivity improvement when you give somebody who has been using no machine to somebody who's using a machine, um, that creates a productivity, um, the, in, the, the marginal change in productivity slows. Um, and so the question is, are there other countries like that? You know, there's high hope for India, there's less hope for the, some other areas that are impoverished, Africa, for instance. But you never know where the next productivity, human productivity boom will come from. Um, but that, de -glo that globalization um, is now threatened by um, nationalism, which has been um, a trend for uh, a decade. Um, you know, obviously we saw Brexit and then we saw uh, significant tariffs being placed by the Trump administration. We saw... Um, uh, countries throughout the world closing their borders to immigrants or trying to slow immigration. And we still see countries that really have no immigration policy like Japan and how they struggle. Um, and so what is immigration? It's bringing somebody to your country who can produce for your country who was probably less productive in their country. And so each of, each of those things... Um, the nationalism that is populism, nationalism that is now global. Um, and then you have hot wars that divide allegiances and you have reactions to uh, Ukraine with sanctions that change the dynamic for owning US dollar based assets or Western assets if you have the potential of being an enemy of that, um, those countries. All of those things are, you know, fueling deglobalization, and they have specific outcomes um, which are super inefficient and inflationary. You know, for one one example is if you have an optimal supply chain that's global, and you decide to replicate it. Um, firstly, you spend on it, which is inflationary, and then you end up destroying wealth because the people who build those things are now going to be fighting for price with the duplicate supply chain that already exists. And so it's deflationary eventually once the spending gets done and it's belt and suspenders or insurance premium or whatever you want to call it so that you don't 
have a COVID situation where your supply chain is not um, robust enough, that's an inefficient use of capital. It may be desirable politically, but it's not great for investing and it's not great for the economy to create wasteful capacity. And so that's happening. And then you have AI, which may one day, will one day, undoubtedly will one day, the question is when, uh, be a productivity enhancement. And when it is a meaningful productivity enhancement, that will be deflationary. Um, and when it is, we'll have to figure out what the people that are that whose jobs were displaced, because if there's no displacement, you get productivity, uh, but you don't get a lot, as much savings. Um, and so we'll have to see what to do to create income for those people. Uh, but that those future deflationary impacts of the what's going on in the world right now um, are still not paying fruit, you know, paying off yet. All they're doing is creating inflationary spending, whether it's servers or chip factories or any of the things in the in the Inflation Reduction Act or any of the things done being done globally to duplicate supply chains. All of that is spending today. And so we have concurrent inflationary drivers and deflationary drivers. It just appears now that the inflationary drivers are in the driver's seat and will continue to be for the time being. Andy, uh, I want to add. Yeah. I wouldn't phrase it that way. I would okay. say inflationary drivers exist now and we may get deflationary benefits from it. That, that the point is to get deflationary benefits from it, but that doesn't always happen. Got it. Now let's talk about fiscal spending. You were you were pounding the table last year on how a recession is not imminent because if you just look at the aggregate level of spending in the economy, we don't see any slowdown in demand on the horizon. I want to ask you about fiscal dominance, the level of deficits that we have relative to GDP right now, uh, unprecedented in a non-war time. We have that dynamic with also what you're referring to with the private sector, with high interest rates, making new projects more, less likely to get funded. And then of course, existing debt more expensive to roll over. So you have fiscal dominance currently with the restrictive or not even restrictive enough monetary policy in the background. These two dynamics are fighting with each other. So can you just explain to us from your perspective how do you think about the fiscal dominance merit narrative with the backdrop of restrictive monetary policy? Um, so I don't think that fiscal dominance is the thing that it, 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 I think that fiscal dominance was a very important factor in uh, maintaining uh, GDP growth uh, during a period of time when no one else could spend. But I don't think that's what's happening now. And I don't think the fact that there is a budget deficit is pro-growth. Um, in fact, what matters, so what matters to the economy is whether the aggregate government spending is going up at a rate above GDP growth. If it is, then the government is causing part of the real growth. And without a doubt, they did. In, um, they were the, the, you know, most of the GDP in periods of, in the COVID era. Um, but today, um, government expenditures are nowhere near growing. In fact, they're not growing. There's, there's you have to just take away wealth transfers and look at, real spending on real stuff. Um, and the US government is not, even though it's running a deficit, that deficit isn't growing. And the important part, it has to grow. The total spending has to grow at a rate above the GDP. Otherwise it's a drag. And I would describe government, current gover government um, finance as being a drag to growth, not a boon to growth, not, not something that's helping growth. Um, 
Now it was, and some might say, well, you know, there's all this money sitting around um, that the government had spent. But that money has to start having velocity, which it does. Wage growth is may have benefited from all the money printing that it was done, but it isn't new government deficits that are creating growth at this stage. In fact, Understood. They're, they're, in fact, they're causing growth to slow. Understood. And so we have a period of large deficits, increasing deficits in the early 2020s that have slowed. So Andy, if you could just point us to the, the, the metric to watch then, you're saying watch the deficit as a percentage of GDP and, relative to the most recent print of that. Is that what you're, what you're well, implying? I think, the, I think the simple math is, what does the government spend? That's government expenditures. It's an, a line item, total government expenditures. Is that number growing or staying the same? If it's growing, how fast is it growing? And so that doesn't matter about financing it. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's taxes or debt. It matters if it's growing or not, because that literally is the GDP. It's the G in the GDP equation. And that number has to be growing at a number that is higher than the GDP growth to be a contributor. Otherwise, it's a drag. Uh, Andy, some have argued that the interest income channel in which the private sector, which holds all these treasuries at now higher coupon, higher interest rates, receiving that coupon income is a material stimulative demand or uh, materially stimulative to aggregate demand in the economy. What's your response to that? Well, it is in the way I just described, um, in that that is the GDP growth, sorry, the expenditure growth. It includes that. And then you have to apply a multiple, uh, a multiplier to it. Is this in fact being spent or is it being saved? Because remember, every dollar that gets paid out has to then be funded. And so if you were to think this through and say, well, we're paying wealthy people who have treasury bills and corporations who have treasury bills um, interest, uh, who's, who's funding that? Well, it's a deficit. Okay. So taxpayers are funding part of it, and then the rest is being borrowed. Who's borrowing it? Well, if it's taxpayers, it's the same guys. If somebody's borrowing it, who's borrowing it? You know, who's the, who's, who are we borrowing from? And chances are we're borrowing from the same people. So all those things have nothing to do with real growth. They're just a money switch. Excellent. And now, Andy, I want to ask you about the bills specifically. You mentioned 22% of uh, outstanding treasury supply in bills. Yes, the Treasury wants to decrease this down to a normal range. You mentioned that it might stay high for a long time. Could it go higher in if Yellen is scared to hit the market with more duration? Sure. She can do whatever she wants. There's no capacity. Okay, so we'll, no we'll There's no law. There's only politics. And I know that the I know a, a, a number of of people are very carefully watching these types of things and have informed um, the members of Congress on their side of the aisle about the consequences of her doing that. But maybe she could she she could keep doing it she again. So more bills. again, so Andy Andy definitely has his eyes on Washington, which we find interesting. We're gonna we're gonna continue to watch that as well because you mentioned Michael Hal. I want to ask you. What do you think about his liquidity model? I find it I find it interesting that he uses the word liquidity to describe his construct when it means something so different to others. What do you have a take on it? So the concept that Michael's trying to capture, I think is an excellent concept and something I use constant like it's base of my framework, which and we started with this. And what we started with was what I really want to know is the amount of savings that are available to invest and the amount of investments that are looking to be sold or owned by somebody. And 
Then I want to add on top of that the risk pro tolerance of the people that are buying and the riskiness of the things that are in the market or being issued in the market. And so that concept is an excellent key concept for understanding financial markets. Um, I'm just not sure that uh, I, I'm highly confident that it would affect things other than the most, um, what's the right word, the most, uh, the things that attract the most people to focus on and want to pay for analysis. And somehow all we get to see with most of the liquidity providers is uh, the liquidity, net, the net liquidity concept providers is um, correlations with things that are just meme stuff that appeals to a certain audience while the concept should and must apply to assets in general. And I don't see that happening in the output of that work. That's fair. And Andy, do you have any last concluding thoughts on the move in gold? Is, it, is there some geopolitical shift that you're thinking about? Is this, um, is this part of what you're looking at in terms of how you're thinking about macro right now? Sure. Um, you know, I think the first thing is to take the possibility that global central banks um, for a period of time that probably started in mid um, in December when um, inexplicably the central bank decided to essentially declare victory and um, set the path for rate cuts, which then got uh, advanced so quickly that there were seven priced in for 2024. Currently there are two. Um, and that hype, that mania, um, made all of us question whether the Fed and other global central banks was committed to its inflation target. And now we're starting to see that. Are they? They haven't been tested yet because they haven't cut. If they were to cut while inflation is bouncing back, that would be a really good reason to own gold. It means they had given up on their inflation target and they were for some reason cutting even though inflation was strong. Um, and so I think there's something there. And then there are the, the, the um, central banks have been buying, um, US consumers have been selling. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a real thing that's going on. Um, you see it in Bitcoin as well in that, you know, this, this idea that we could be in higher for longer inflation period is, and that the central banks are less credible is a good reason to own those assets. Um, at this stage, it's hard to tell whether it's, there's, it's fully priced. I do think it is. Um, what I would like, the, the reason, the way I would say it, it is this, um, I do expect, um, maybe as early as 1.15 this afternoon when Powell speaks, for him to reestablish his credibility as an inflation fighter that I think over the last four months, while some of the members of the committee have continued to make it very clear that they were, uh, um, what's the rush? He has not yet validated that in a way that I think is convincing. And it may be happened at 115 today. It may happen at the FOMC. It may not happen at all, which is a different thing. But if it does happen, I think these assets that have gone, this reflation idea uh, will take a back, uh, will, um, you know, correct a bit. Inflation is a terrible tax on us all, says Andy Constan, who uh, for the first time is actually supporting the idea that Bitcoin and gold might be receiving the same type of demand. Um, exciting stuff, Andy. Really appreciate your time. And thank you jo for joining us at the Bitcoin layer. Please tell people where they can find your institutional um, institutional service. Sure. Dampspring.com is the best place to get me. Great. Andy, thanks again. And we'll catch you guys next time. Great. Special thanks to River for sponsoring this channel. Purchase Bitcoin without any fees when you use River's DCA feature. 
River has become our trusted source of accessing the Bitcoin market because they don't use any third party custodians. This is a very, very important thing to understand. River is not using another company to store the Bitcoin for them. They have their own multi-signature solutions, which means that they have designed their own way to make sure nobody else has responsibility for the Bitcoin for the time that you have River hold your Bitcoin for you on their platform once you have purchased it. So go check out river.com today. Thanks for sticking with us as always at the Bitcoin layer. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our Substack at the bitcoinlayer.substack.com so that you can follow along our latest research and analysis.